Let me ask you a question. What colour is a video game explosive barrel? Is it green? Purple? No, of course not. Generic video game explosive barrels are red. Of course they are. Explosive red barrels are in the new Doom games, they're in Hitman, they're in Zelda, and they're even in real-time strategy games like Command & Conquer. Explosive barrels are everywhere, even in places where they have no logical reason to exist. And yet, the history of barrels as a game design element goes back to the earliest days of the medium. So why do these things keep popping up over and over again? And why do so many games use barrels in the exact same way? Well, that's because generic video game explosive barrels aren't just barrels. I mean, they are barrels, but they're also something else as well. And that is a symbol. See, explosive barrels represent a very useful and versatile design element, particularly in shooters. A stationary target that when used correctly has the potential to do massive damage, but also represents a potential threat to the player. This creates a very fun dynamic that encourages good positioning, timing and planning to get the most out of the explosion whilst also staying safe yourself. It's not hard to see why FPS games would want something barrel-esque in their levels, but why this uniform shape and colour? Well, the red part is easy. It's a colour that we normally associate with risk and danger and is very eye-catching at a glance, communicating to players who aren't familiar with the concept that these things are dangerous even before they've realised the barrels can explode. It's worth noting that Doom, one of the games responsible for popularising explosive barrels in the first place, made them this ugly, hard-to-spot grey colour, which often meant you'd accidentally kill yourself before you managed to spot them, with subsequent games learning from its mistake. The shape has a similar story. It's understated enough that it can be used in many environments without feeling out of place, whilst also being iconic enough to recognise immediately. As the explosive barrel was popularised by 90s shooters, it became easier for new games to simply include barrels of their own, rather than invent whole new items that did more or less the same thing, because audiences were already familiar with what barrels did and how to use them. Just like that, barrels became a symbol. They aren't just a level feature or a mechanic, they communicate a specific challenge and style of gameplay in a near-universal visual language. Barrels are such a video game staple that people even say that they're overused and too much of a game design trope, and several video games have lampshaded their inclusion as well. You know what sucks? Here we are, in the middle of South America, standing or whatever it's done. All special operationed up, still blowing up barrels. These people are, of course, wrong, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Barrels aren't the only video game symbol. There is an entire hidden gaming language we don't ordinarily notice that teaches us how to play, adds that extra level of immersion, and even controls our decision making, all communicated through symbology. Take Spikes, for example, the universal video game symbol for Don't Touch This. Because the painful sensation of touching something sharp and a subsequent aversion to spiky things is common to everyone but the kinkiest of masochists, and the fact that they're very easy to draw with just a couple of pixels, Spikes became the obstacle of choice for early platformers, and later became a staple trope. This led to games branching out into stuff like thorns, teeth, and saw blades that retained the same spiky iconography, and in doing so, sidestepped the need to teach players what these obstacles do because their function and effect is obvious from the start. Symbols and iconography are even useful outside of actual gameplay and are a huge part of intuitive and efficient UI design. Take this little fella. What does this mean? Well, it's obviously the symbol for saving your game. We can see it in Celeste, Superliminal, Cave Story, and many other more recent games. However, as people old enough to recognise it will know, the save icon is actually depicting a floppy disk, a piece of technology that has been obsolete for upwards of 25 years. The fact that we don't use floppy disks anymore is irrelevant, because the save symbol communicates a very specific message in a universal way, and has come to mean so much more than just the icon for an out-of-date storage medium. Symbols can come in all shapes and sizes, and make up some of the foundational tropes of the medium and culture in general. The most amazing part is, the good use of symbolism is basically invisible, with games communicating details and changing our state of mind without us ever really being aware of it. For example, if you've ever played a Legend of Zelda game, you'll know what a boss monster having a big glowing eye means. Yep, it's an obvious invitation for you to shoot an arrow or swing your sword at their weak point to do massive damage. It is obviously a huge coincidence that a large proportion of Ganon's minions just so happen to share the same weakness, but as far as their gameplay experience is concerned, it's very useful, leaving players to fumble around just trying to work out how to damage a boss 
is very much fun, so it's better to communicate the exact nature of the challenge they're facing right away with something obvious and universal rather than play coy and make the boss fight less engaging purely for the sake of realism. On a similar note, even the architecture of gaming levels can act in a symbolic fashion. Architecture? On this channel? What am I thinking, right? Pre-boss rest spots that give players a chance to save their game, heal up and maybe buy some items before a boss fight have become part of the language of level design as people learn to recognise these sorts of rooms and the tough battles that inevitably follow them. These areas now communicate to players an opportunity to prepare themselves both physically and mentally and are a great place to take a little break or go and make yourself a drink because there's likely to be a stretch of hard gameplay right beyond the next door. One of the most effective ways to change how a player thinks lies in a set of symbols that are a little bit more abstract though, namely, colours. You might not think that colour conveys anything more than visual information, but it's been a huge part of how games talk to players since the days of arcade machines when palettes were very limited. We already know that red symbolises danger, but all colours have their place in the symbolic vocabulary. Purple is a colour that's used all over the place as a shorthand for corruption, evil and general villainy. This is because purple is a very rare and valuable pigmentation in nature, giving environments an alien quality and drawing allusions to royalty when used as part of character design. Also, in the days when sprite artists didn't have as many colours to work with, purple was a great accent colour for dark and evil looking environments and characters, a tradition that's continued even as graphics tech has improved. Take a look at this area from Ori and the Will of the Wisps. Simply by changing the primary colour on display, this entire area goes from happy and full of life to eerie and corrupted in a matter of moments. It's also important to think about the contrast and relationship between colours. You might have noticed that despite being a fixture in most games, health as a concept has no commonly associated colour. Sometimes it's depicted as being red, green or even sometimes blue or white. This is because on top of having no physical real world analogue to draw from, it's more important for health to be visible than it is for it to convey a consistent theme across games. In Doom's orange and grey environments, health is blue because it stands out in a firefight. In Darkest Dungeon, health is red to accentuate these stark colour palettes, and in games where you need to view the health of both allies and enemies, or your remaining health quickly, green is often used as it contrasts nicely with red. One of the most universal colour symbols is light itself. Humans are naturally drawn to it, and so light is used all over the place as a navigational aid. In Dark Souls, the light of even unlit bonfires can be seen from miles away. In Journey, the big laser beam coming out of the mountain helps to orient you in the seemingly endless desert of the game's first half, and the Uncharted games even use colours normally associated with light, primarily yellow, to subtly guide players through the platforming sections. When you actually think about it, it's insane that someone would have run ahead of Nathan Drake and the gang spray painting all the ledges yellow, but that doesn't really matter, because the most important qualities of effective symbology are that it's memorable and that it communicates its meaning intuitively, not necessarily that it makes perfect sense. This is why the classical elements of Earth, water, fire and air, as well as a bunch of other ones depending on where you come from, have remained such powerful symbols in human culture in spite of their obvious scientific wrongness. They're evocative and come with a whole host of cultural assumptions about how they ought to work as well as what they ought to feel like to play around with. When we see, for example, fire, it symbolises so much more to us than simply the fact there's a combustion reaction going on. Fire communicates risk passion and danger, and having that reflected in gameplay feels very satisfying because it harmonises with our inherent cultural assumptions. Similarly, when games play with fire as a theme, it nearly always translates into high-risk, aggressive playstyles. Magic the Gathering's red deck centre on all-out aggression, Lena the Fire Mage in Dota spams high damage spells, and the Pyro in Team Fortress 2 is all about charging into the fight at short range. Not only does this theme add to the fun of playing these characters, but their design quickly gets across what they're all about, even for people who've never seen them before. There's no reason why you can't have a slow, bulky, defensively oriented character designed to look like a fire elemental or something, but that lack of symbolic and mechanical harmony will always make them feel a little bit weird to play. Water is another classic element that has a strong presence in video games. Purely by existing in the world and being alive, we have a strong intuitive grasp of fluid mechanics and what water does when it interacts with various other things. For example, Noiter doesn't need to explain how its many different fluids work together and interact, because stuff like water putting out fire and oil floating on top are interactions that intuitively make sense. Similarly, wet enemies being vulnerable to electrocution in Breath of the Wild and water freezing when it's exposed to ice attacks in Genshin Impact are particularly scientific interactions, but they do make a lot of intuitive sense, and so players never need to be taught about these mechanics, they'll discover them naturally through play. 
In short, when games have mechanics that match up thematically with their chosen symbology, not only can players internalize them much more comfortably, but they're also much easier to remember. And elemental symbols are some of the longest lived and most successful ones in history for exactly this reason. However, this is where the downsides of leaning too hard on symbology start to become apparent. While leveraging the appeal of having our expectations met is great, if developers don't add enough of their own flair to levels or characters, the symbols and associated tropes can end up overpowering the rest of the level design. Mario games love using themed worlds because the aesthetic symbology is a great way of telling players what to expect. Ice levels are going to have slippery floors, Bowser levels are going to have traps and lava, you get the picture. However, this rigid adherence to theming can lead to levels feeling samey and kind of generic, so it's important to give players what they want, but also surprise them with new takes on established ideas. For example, when developing Shovel Knight, Yacht Club used classic level design tropes, but also went out of their way to spruce up these tired concepts with new ideas, satisfying players looking for that classic feel, but also developing a unique identity. With wading beetles you've got to bounce on to get through lava levels, and ice levels with aurora spewing fountains used to cross gaps. These places still evoke classic ice and fire levels, being based around lengthy horizontal platforming gauntlets and terrain you can't trust respectively, but put that little bit of extra work in to view those tired tropes from a new perspective. Sometimes, developers can even lose control of their symbology and end up communicating things to players that they weren't intending. It's important for cover shooters like Gears of War to subtly teach players to distinguish between what is and is not cover through consistent size and shape of boxes, barriers, and bits of rock, to avoid players accidentally trying to hide behind scenery. However, players can often get a little bit too good at spotting obligatory chest-high walls. In my otherwise beloved Mass Effect 2, there's a mission that sees you exploring an abandoned collector ship. That is, until chest high walls start appearing, which immediately inform you there's a fight coming, spoiling the surprise when the bugmen inevitably turn up. Of course, it's also worth mentioning that many of gaming's most effective symbols can also exclude people with disabilities. Red barrels aren't going to be anywhere near as effective to someone who's colorblind, for example, meaning that developers need to double or triple up on the symbols in order to ensure that the message gets across for everyone. People often like to point to tropes and common symbols like chest-high walls or barrels as proof of lazy, uninspired game design. But the truth of the matter is that these things are an inescapable part of the gaming vocabulary and carry with them decades of crucial culture and lessons relevant to both designers and players. If developers went out of their way to avoid using these kinds of symbols, we'd be left with games that feel less intuitive to play and less thematically consistent without much in the way of advantages. By drawing on the shared cultural knowledge between developers and players, games can bridge the gap of communication between the two sides and allow the people who make games to better explain what the things they make are all about, whilst also letting the people who play them enjoy a more immersive, seamless experience. So the next time you see an explosive barrel, or an out of place weak point, or even a nature themed character who just so happens to specialise in healing, consider that this isn't lazy game design, but instead a way for the developer to tell you, the player, what to expect, and which ways to have the most fun. Because, let's be honest, just pointing out the tropes and pretending like that's all it takes to be a media critic makes us no better than CinemaSins, which, uh, it's not exactly a high bar, is it? Hello, viewers. First of all, don't worry, the end of year special is about halfway done and well and truly on the way. It'll be out after Christmas once all the sales have started, which actually, now that I think about it, they may have done by the time this goes out to the public. Who knows? Anyway, while you wait, how about checking out Eurothug4000, or as she's otherwise known, Maria. All of her videos are incredibly lovely and are just fantastic video game related comfort food. A particular favourite one is her video on size differences in games, because it's a topic I tried and failed to write about around about 6 months ago, and this video covers pretty much everything I was going to say in around half the time. She's great, please do give her a watch. Though, it does go without saying that the greatest people of all are my patrons, who get to enjoy behind the scenes stuff, bonus content, and even shoutouts like what I'm going to do now. A special top tier thank you to Alex Deloch, Andrew Lebrano, Asaran, Ashley Shade, Ausakav, Baxter Heel, Big Chess, Brian Notariani, Constantin Punkt, Daniel Metges, David Setzer, Dirk Jan Karambeld, Ecton, Edward Franklin Woods, Eugene Bulkin, Evie, Philip Magnus, Gazkull, George Sears, Greta Hannison, Jacob Dylan Riddle, Jesse Rhine, Joey Bruno, Jordan Gear, Joshua Binswanger, Janos Fakete, Kai Gillespie, Lee Berman, Lucas Slack, Lunar Eagle 1996, 
Mace Window 54, Max Filipov, Nate Graff, NWDD, Patrick Romberg, Philby the Bilby, Reddit X, there is a D in there, I forgot to write down ages ago, my apologies, Regal Regex, Ray's Dad, Samuel Vanderplatz, Sheldon Hearn, Simon Jacobson, Steve Riley, Strategia and Ultima, Tom the Fizz, and Chow. Okay, thank you for watching, happy Festag, and I will see you in just over a week for 2020 games you should have played. Bye!